Uh, welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us on a Friday. Uh, my name is Dara St. Louis. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm one of the founding partners here at Reach3 Insights. Uh, I wanted to uh, welcome you today to discuss experiential marketing 2.0. We have a panel of experts that I'm really excited to introduce to you. Uh, but before we do, uh, before I do that, I wanted to give you a little bit more about the plan today. It's going to be 45 minutes in length, kind of this ask and answer style, and uh, you'll hear about some interesting measurement work that Coca-Cola is doing. So excited for you to hear about that. And uh, we're also going to share some uh, research that we've done on experiential, as well as our uh, learn a little bit more about our solution called Brand uh, BXP, our brand experience predictor solution for experiential measurement. That'll leave us a, a few minutes at the end to do a Q&A question uh, period with the uh, expert panel that we have. You'll see the widget, uh, the Q&A widget along the top. Please use that one over the, the chat. Eileen's going to be managing that for us and we'll share out the questions there at the end. So thank you again for joining. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so first up we have Greg Farrow. Greg is the Global Senior Director of Communications and Marketing Effectiveness at the Coca-Cola Company. He has worldwide, uh, he has worldwide communications, advertising, and, and media diagnostics and data services, helping Coke to maximize its return on marketing investment. He also co-chairs the Measurement and Accountability Committee for the ANA, the Association of National Advertisers. He's a recognized expert in advertising insights, forecasting, earned media analytics, ad copy assessment, and marketing ROI. Most recently, Greg co-developed artificial intelligence techniques for predicting ad performance prior to airing. Uh, prior to airing. So welcome, Greg. Thank you for joining us. Next up, we have Ed, Ed Keller. So Ed is a CEO of the Keller Ad Advisory Group. He's a two-time award-winning author, including the Influentials, a two-time Hall of Famer, having been inducted into both the Market Research Council Hall of Fame and the the Market Research Hall of Fame and the Word of Mouth Marketing Hall of Fame. He's also an advisor to Reach Three Insights on our experiential marketing solution that we'll be discussing today called BXP. Welcome, Ed. And next we have Eileen Campbell. So Eileen Campbell is our board chair. She's a long history of, uh, of marketing and research along with partners, Andrew and Jennifer Reed. Eileen launched Rival Group in 2018. The current holdings of Rival Group include Rival Technologies and Reach3 Insight. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, what you likely noticed today is that our speakers are clearly experts in their field, but more importantly to me is that they are genuinely super nice people. They're down to earth. I've learned a lot from them, and I hope you take away a few things today as well. So with that, let's get going. And nothing like starting off a webinar with a lot of color to get uh, everyone uh, focused on whatever the high energy of Friday. So if we take a look at the numbers, though, it's uh, no surprise that stats like these, that brands are really excited to connect with customers. Four and five want to engage in brand experiences, and over one and two are likely to share or tell others about these experiences. What do you see happening in the in the industry, Ed, when we take a look at what's happening here and, and more broadly? Yeah, so I think the numbers that we see here tell us just how excited consumers are to uh, to to engage in brand experiences, which I think is a is a is a great thing to see from the marketer's point of view. You know, today's media landscape continues to be more fragmented. Uh, gen to generate media uh, meaningful ROI from traditional ads has become more challenging as a result. And so marketers are increasingly investing in physical and digital experiential brand activations. And by that, we're talking about things like creator content. We're talking about pop-ups, the metaverse, stunts, celebrity integrations, and events, a variety of techniques to drive consumer engagement. And so I think the message that we're going to be uh, uh, bringing home today is that brands have to look beyond 
conventional campaigns to cut through the clutter if they want to gain competitive advantage with today's consumers. Yeah, that's uh, that's super interesting. But the you know the crazy part to me is that like the the landscape's changing, but the measurement, the metrics, they really aren't kind of keeping up. Um, I don't know, Eileen. What do you think? Uh, do you agree with this? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> And yeah, I couldn't agree more, Dara. Uh, the marketing landscape has changed. The marketing mix landscape has changed so much over the past five years. You know, experiential has always been a part of our toolkit, but I would argue that people tended to think of it as a bit of an afterthought. It was often like a stunt with the goal of, of getting to earned media um, in, in kind of the traditional media. But today that's hardly the case. Um, today's marketers are designing brand experiences born out of a really deep understanding of their consumers, something that, you know, we in the insights world are delighted to see, to see happening. And of course, digital experiences have allowed us to do experiential work at scale, which used to be one of the problems, right, is people didn't think there was enough reach associated with experiential marketing. Um, so, so as brand owners are, are um, starting to get more involved with experiential, their spend has gone up immensely. Um, I have to say, I was absolutely stunned to see that the um, expenditures on experiential in the U.S. alone were $70 billion last year. Um, and that's almost exactly the same as what was spent on linear TV, which, you know, if you think about the millions and millions of dollars and the elaborate systems in place to measure the effectiveness of TV advertising and how little is in place to measure the effectiveness of experiential. There's a real gap there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, as you mentioned at the beginning here, Dara, we've got a real expert in, in understanding the impact of marketing activities on ROI and Greg. So Greg, I really would be interested in hearing more about how, um, how Coca-Cola is thinking about experiential in this context. Well, I mean, I've, I've got to say that uh, for us, experiential is not just here, it's not just real, it's not just happening right now, but it's really front and center for us. Uh, and brands like Coke are doing a lot uh, with it. We've got some very exciting things going on. Now, people are always wondering, okay, what exactly is experiential? What does that mean to uh, for a company like Coca-Cola? And I would say that experiential marketing for us is really a way for to be able to have our brands connect with consumers uh, through experiences in very meaningful ways to really help bring a brand to life. Uh, and we actively engage consumers with our brands in ways that are going to be fun. They're going to be lively and it will generate attention and memory uh, and ultimately loyalty uh, because of uh, the breadth and the depth and the, uh, and the wealth of the experience. Now you've probably, I think everyone's probably heard about uh, the world of Coke, which is our iconic uh, museum and interactive experience that we've got. But in addition to something like World of Coke, uh, which sort of sets the bar for experiential, we have plenty of other examples of uh, experiences which we've been offering up. Just to name a few out, uh, to give you an idea of the diversity of those, they include Dream World, which uh, we launched as a VR, AR, metaverse uh, uh, experience for product launch. Uh, Coke Music Festivals, which are a very, very uh, popular and uh, a wonderful type of, uh, of experience for us. And then um, another experience, which has uh, been very, uh, very fruitful and uh, very lively, has been our pop-up stores, such as one that we had in London um, last year. Um, that one was really, really fun to work with. Uh, Dara, uh, I don't know about you, but I found that to be one of the uh, most uh, lively and engaging experiences which we've offered up yet. I know. Yeah, that one was definitely fun. I love all the experiential work because it just has like, that, you know, there's so much energy around it, uh, Greg. The UX, the, the UK store though, um, you know, that one was interesting in that it really leveraged a BXP. It, you know, it had all the facets of it, the components of it. So the pre-testing to ensure that, you know, the activation was right. And then it had the, you know, the on-site experiential side where, you know, the brand ambassadors engaged customers with a QR code and, 
that, that link to that conversational survey to really capture in the moment evaluations of in the store experience. And again, it, like the few specific areas of the store that you guys were really interested in and um, and it allowed people to, because of the technology, also provide photos and videos like selfies really in the moment. And at the end of the experience, the, uh, of the experiential measurement survey, there was a question that asked for their phone number, which allows people to opt in to, you know, be recontacted. And it's simply the recontact is a text message away. So it's, you know, a day later, two days later, a week later to really get to that longer term impact of the of the experience. So, yeah, it was definitely a, a really fun one. Um, you know, I guess the outcomes of that, if I step back and take a look at, or think about them, it's the, the pre-testing side, but also the live in the moment um, experiential feedback. We had the measurement of brand equity over time and then the, the feedback too to refine the experiential activation for, you know, before further rolling uh, that out. So yeah, that was definitely a, a, a good one and fun one. And there's so many more that uh, we can talk about, but we probably can't talk about them today. So uh, that, uh, that leads us into the experiential, you know, kind of if we, just trying to move here. Let's see, moves us um, into what the kind of the areas of uh, experiential are. So when you think about experiential marketing and testing at a high level to measure an experience, really measuring its 360 view, that kind of end to end, we call this ROE, return on experience. There's really the three core areas, the pre-testing I mentioned, the on-site, and the on-site can be physical or digital. It's really that in the moment part. And then the post visit. So by pre-testing experiential uh, marketing ideas, this really allows you to predict their potential to engage, to motivate, to share, and influence that brand impact. It also allows you to identify the improvement areas, just like we did at the UK store and select key facets of the, you know, the campaign activation. So in the BXP solution, you also have the advantage of uh, a comparison to the normative database. The rival platform, which is uh, the underlying platform we use to run our BXP solution, this leverages a unique mobile first in the moment conversational style, experiential style survey it really understands the first impressions of the activations, the emotional connectedness, and of course, like that cultural relevance. It also allows us the ability to recontact on site attendees and, you know, post experience, just like we did in that UK uh, store example. So let's move on now to an interesting study uh, that we partnered with the Keller Advisory Group on called the Barometer Study. Do you want to take it away, Ed? Yeah, let's. Um... Uh, let's talk a little bit about this. So as, as REACH3 and I were working on uh, building out a, a, a measurement system uh, for experiential marketing, we wanted to start by just understanding how important uh, experiences were uh, from consumers. And so we launched this brand experience barometer and uh, we learned a number of important things. Um, if we think about uh, the consumer perspective, we asked them to compare experiences to traditional forms of advertising. Uh, we found by a, a two to one margin, consumers told us they were more likely to try or use a brand based upon brand experiences versus traditional ads. Uh, feeling positive about a brand, the, uh, the, the, the difference is even greater. It's three to one, 47% uh, uh, say that experiences make them feel more positive compared to 15% for ads. And in terms of emotional connections to a brand, which is particularly important to a lot of marketers Today, the gap is even bigger. It's about it's about three to one. So we started to see the extent to which uh, consumers are really uh, relating to uh, experiences at levels that were, uh, I think, quite quite dramatic. We then asked about a variety. If we go to the next slide, we asked about a variety of of uh, of, of different uh, measures. And um, you know, here we again compared brand experiences uh, to traditional advertising. Which one do you feel is more exciting? 63% uh, to 15% experiences went out, which are more unique, even higher, 71% to 10% in terms of uniqueness, uh, memorability, and why do we do marketing if not to do things that are going to be memorable uh, to consumers so that your brand comes to mind, and in particular, when they're at the point of purchase, they're remembering 
Uh, so memorability, 59% for experiences, 17% for traditional ads. Out of a whole range of metrics, and there were about eight of them all together, the only one that was even close is the measurement on the metric on the right-hand side here about relevance, which is more relevant. Experience wins by a little bit, but just a few points. But Dara, if I can just sort of comment a little bit on this, on this research, you know, when we first set out uh, to do it, I definitely expected experiences to be of interest to consumers, uh, but the extent of that interest and the size of the head-to-head -head advantage for experiences over traditional ads, I, I think is really uh, eye-popping and it should catch the eye of all marketers. Um, yeah. Second thing that jumped out to me is the fact that uh, as, appealing, uh, as an appealing marketing vehicle, uh, experiences satisfy the needs of consumers of all ages. Some people think it's sort of something that, that younger people would want to go to the Coke Music Festival or whatever the other experiences uh, might be. And we do see that uh, in terms of having personally engaged in experiences, it does skew a little bit young, but the interest is very high across all age groups. So this isn't just a matter of, you know, teens and young adults. This is a, uh, a phenomenon that we can think about for consumers of, of all ages. And then lastly is the fact that once people have engaged with brand experiences, they find them to be even, uh, their, their affinity is even stronger. And on the one metric that we have here that was sort of close relevance, for those who have already uh, been a part of brand experiences, uh, relevance goes up to a two to one uh, uh, edge over traditional advertising. So to try it is to, is to love it. And I do expect that we're gonna see more and more people trying it uh, over time. Yeah, you hear a lot about different experiential experiences coming out this summer too, just everybody out and doing a lot more uh, activities. So really looking forward to, to trying some from some of the brands that we have on the call. What about the impact of influentials or voice of market? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Dara, as you said in the intro, I've been involved in studying uh, influencers and influential consumers for about two decades now, since I published a book called The Influentials, and it's been a steady stream of interest to me. When I think about influentials, I'm not just thinking about people with sort of paid Instagram uh, followings or publishing creator content on YouTube. These are the influentials who people seek out for advice and recommendations, and so we were quite interested to see how that subgroup of consumers uh, might, uh, might be thinking about brand experiences. And, and uh, uh, I worked with, uh, with, with the Reach3 team on this. We created a, a battery to identify this, uh, this segment, about 15% of the population. And lo and behold, this, uh, this group does really pop on brand experiences. And what's important to us about that is that generally where the influential consumers go, the rest of the population follows because they're people who like to talk about things that they find interesting. Uh, people in their network like to hear from them about those things. So it's kind of an equal exchange of, of, of information. And so we found out that they are in fact, twice as likely to have already participated uh, in brand experiences. A, a whopping 90% of them uh, either love or really like the idea of brand experiences. So we can be sure that with those, that type of affinity, these are exactly the types of things that they wanna talk about uh, for others and for every one of the eight attributes of brand experiences versus traditional advertising experiences win handily among this influential uh, group of, of consumers, including the one that we, uh, that we see here, relevance, which wasn't quite as high for the influential consumers, uh, it, it, it is. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Thank you, Ed, for sharing all of that. Um, it was a really interesting study to, to be part of that and, you know, really build in your, your expertise. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the influential side of things and building that into our, you know, the BXP solution that allowed us to include that layer of, you know, the, the weighting of those influentials into the scoring. And I think that's really important. So, um, with that, I think we should probably move on to discuss a little bit of the, you know, the, the pillars of BXP, which are, you know, engage. Engage is the first one where intent to engage, participate in an experience. So we're measuring that. Share, intent to share with others. Again, we're measuring that so that we can see across the studies and within the studies what's working, what's not on these, these key pillars. Impact, that overall brand impact. 
So these are the key pillars, but there's also diagnostic feedback that lets you know where uh, the experience is most compelling, where it's falling short in the hearts and minds of consumers. And Greg was talking about that earlier as well, just kind of the, the minds and the hearts. So it's just an important part here. Um, the norms, the norms are also, you know, they allow you to compare to other activations by your company or other companies in your category, just at an over, overall level. A level. Is there anything I'm missing, Ed? Um, what do you feel about that overlay of influentials and, uh, you know, the, the norms? Are they important? Well, so first of all, I, I think norms are, are, are vitally important. You know, you give, you give any, any company feedback on, on anything, but certainly in terms of, you know, experiences and you tell them what their score is. The very first question is, is that a good number? Is that a bad number? How do other people do? Everybody wants to be at the head of the class and know that they're uh, sort of leading the way here. So, you know, we invested a lot as we were building this system and we have quite a strong normative base already. So we can tell people on both your overall dimension, you're kind of, you know, top of the class, you're about average or you're trailing behind uh, others. And, um, uh, but then secondly, we can do it across these various dimensions as well. You're really stellar when it comes to having a, an activation that's engaging people but they're not as likely to share it as they are a number of other uh, activations, perhaps. So it also helps point the way to where you can strengthen things. And I think that one of the uh, benefits of the system over time is that people can begin to learn lessons from leaders as well. We can begin to tell you, here's the kinds of things that will help you increase shareability because we've seen others that are stellar on that, uh, uh, on that type of a, uh, of a dimension. So I, I think there's a lot of power in, in, what, in what we are building here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So what do you think, Greg? Is this uh, in line with where Coca-Cola's, uh, you know, taking or going um, with the experientials? How was it before? Can you give us kind of a, a lay of the land for you? Yeah, I mean, it certainly is uh, quite in line with uh, where we are and where and uh, the direction that we're going in. Okay. Um, you know, uh, as we look at this, um, it becomes very, very important to be able to uh, get our minds around uh, around how we can measure engagement, how we can uh, measure uh, and understand and learn about uh, sharing, which goes on, uh, which involves uh, word of mouth, but also other forms of being able to share as well. And then uh, finally, uh, on top of all that, uh, the impact which it has. And one of the things uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, we have uh, really learned there is just a need to uh, be able to uh, step back, you know, and uh, and really appreciate that uh, with experiential marketing, uh, with experiences, uh, that uh, we have to be willing to let go of some of the artifacts of the past, okay? Because existing legacy metrics aren't really optimized for modern uh, experiential marketing. Uh, the metrics which we had been using uh, around at Coke and in the industry in general were uh, designed for traditional broadcast media, okay? And they were also very fragmented and very incomplete. Um, and we also found that we just had kind of a grab bag of uh, different uh, products for measuring experiences. And all of these different uh, products were uh, very siloed in a way. They weren't really integrated together. And um, I just can't say it enough. I think the image says it all. But, you know, at the end of the day, the mindset had really been oriented around uh, traditional testing and measurement for television, uh, which has its place. But at the end of the day, uh, the issues that we had there were that uh, it's just not, it was uh, not really the right way of thinking about and measuring and learning and getting insights on experiences. Okay, thank you, Greg. What about for you, Eileen? Just to kind of keep this going, you have a deep experience in, you know, ad testing space. Uh, what's unique about what Greg's, um, you know, saying Greg and the team are really, you know, looking for? Yeah, you know, I spend a lot of years working with the team, with the team to, to help build those sort of systems. And I think Greg's made a really compelling case for how we need to think differently about the measurement when it comes to experiential marketing. I'd like to advocate that we need systematic, consistent, and repeatable approaches 
um, for how we plan and evaluate experiential marketing. As we mentioned earlier, the spend is getting so significant and the stakes are so high that we can't afford to be kind of flying by the seat of our pants. And also if we want experiential to be taken seriously by the executives who fund our budgets, um, we have to be able to show proof that the ideas are good ideas, that they were implemented effectively, and that they have long-term impact on both the brand and on people's behavior when it comes to um, purchasing and category. Um, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about norms and, and why they're so important. Certainly in my old world, norms were immensely important. But, you know, this whole idea of how do we provide context? You know, some of you on the webinar will know me and will have seen me beyond just head and shoulders. But, you know, in my world, I might think of myself at five foot tall as a tall person because I don't have, in the absence of norms, you know, that's how I see myself. Um, clearly, I'm not tall at five feet, our experiences may not be as successful as we like to convince ourselves inside our own companies without that contextual relevance. So I'm a big advocate for developing normative databases so that we as marketers, just like we as individuals, don't delude ourselves um, about what's good, what's bad, what's frankly indifferent. You know, one of the things we used to hear all the time in traditional marketing, um, and, and we hear it also with experiences, is oh, we don't have time to test. Um, and I think those are those are that's a barrier we've got to overcome. If experiential is to be taken seriously and treated as a planful brand building um, aspect, we have to be testing these ideas to make sure that we're not creating real risk for our companies. I'll give you an example from my old category in film marketing. Um, when when Paramount was marketing Mission Impossible Three, uh, they did this. They did this basically a stunt where they had these little device boxes that they planted around um, communities. And if you opened it up, it played the um, Mission Impossible music. Uh, needless to say, very few people opened it up because they were too busy calling the bomb squad. Um, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the whole thing became a real nightmare and actually included some penalties that the, the brand had to pay. So needless to say, make the time to test it really does it really does matter so i think we've got a, a you know quite a strong case for developing the same sort of rigor and discipline in the experiential space that we've done in traditional marketing um but greg i know when when you sort of started experimenting with this you saw that you know you mentioned that the existing tools really didn't do the trick can you share a little bit about how you thought the tools needed to evolve and what you, the changes you drove to make, make um, experiential measurement successful for Coca-Cola? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we need to be able to do was that uh, we were looking for specific capabilities and characteristics and the measures and the metrics, okay? And uh, in order to really get all the way to bright, we knew that there were at least three key things that we need to be able to do. One was to be able to have complete coverage, okay? What do I mean by complete coverage? That is being able to have a way of, uh, of pre-testing and measuring in real time, as well as getting uh, some after experience feedback uh, for all of the different uh, types of experiences that we have. And that completeness, I just cannot emphasize the importance of it because um, you know, uh, some people will settle for just having, uh, you know, uh, one eye of vision, but the reality of it is if you don't have a line of sight on how half of your assets, on how half of your investment's working, in some ways that's worse than being completely blind, okay? You tend to over-rotate to that which you do have visibility on. So completeness of coverage is absolutely critical. Another key thing, uh, as you think about experiences are just so variable, okay? That means that with that variability, you have to have a measurement approach, a measurement platform, which is going to be versatile, okay? And um, that is going to be able to uh, be versatile because you'll need to be able to use it upfront in order to help craft and measure and assess in the pre-testing process. And then it's going to have to be versatile enough to be able to uh, collect information, provide good uh, insights uh, uh, once the experience is live. 
And if you think about the very many different types of experiences which we have, which might be gaming, it might be a virtual or augmented reality, it could be a retail experience, it could be a music experience, all of those call for uh, different and sometimes very creative approaches on uh, being able to collect meaningful uh, insights uh, from consumers. And it's that combination of uh, in the moment feedback and the rich post experience feedback combined with the pre testing, with a good realistic pre testing approach, uh, which uh, is really going to make that uh, come to life. And then finally, uh, it's going to have to be uh, comprehensive. And I think that one of the biggest challenges we have with comprehension is uh, going to is really around uh, how it's uh, measured. And for that, KPIs are going to be a little bit different, okay? Now, in our case uh, at Coca-Cola, we have uh, taken uh, the tact of having a flexible but comprehensive metrics framework, what we call head, heart, and hand approach. Uh, head, of course, uh, May, uh, standing for those measures, those metrics we have uh, around thinking, around attention, uh, heart about the emotional resonance, and hand, which is really around the action which comes, whether it is uh, engagement or uh, some other sort of drive to action. So by having a flexible metric framework, which then uses uh, you know a um, the right KPIs, which ladder together, uh, we're ultimately able to have things ladder up to be able to uh, measure impact. So um, I would say that um, the type of specific actionable metrics which we're going to have here and which we do use are subtly different from uh, what we have used in the past. I would also just in complete transparency say that uh, it's not a uh, finished job for us. Uh, we're still very much, you know, um, uh, tuning, in some cases, experimenting with different metrics uh, in order to make sure that we have a good comprehensive, comprehensive coverage and understanding and uh, codification. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Greg. And I, it's interesting because like even just if you're on LinkedIn, you can see all of the different kind of areas like you mentioned gaming and, you know, festivals, there's so many different parts to it. So really coming up with the 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 right metrics. And this is where BXP does, you know, kind of fit in because it's focused on experiences. So non-traditional advertising. Um, you know, I think we should go ahead now and just uh, show you a quick video on BXP. Um, and then we can we can take it from there. So you'll see what that's all about. Uh, if you, Greg, I can see you in kind of the panel. So if you can't hear the sound, just uh, give me some kind of sign. <laughs> Thank you. Experiences are what people remember. Share, celebrate, reward. In a world saturated by mass media, experiential brand activations rise above the noise to create emotional connections that shape customer expectations and define brands. New domains like the metaverse have redefined what's possible, recalibrating what makes on-site and virtual events a success. To get it right, modern marketers must think beyond concept testing and leverage new methods and technology to test stimuli in the moments that matter most. Mitigating risk, forecasting success. Um, I just fell off the event. I thought it was really fun. Introducing the Brand Experience Predictor, an innovative way to validate, launch, and measure the impact of experiential campaigns. Uncovering deeper, richer insights at every phase of campaign creation and execution. Pre-test. Understand the potential of new ideas and invest strategically. On-site. Gather in-the-moment feedback. Post visit. Measure the ongoing impact of your experience. BXP helps brands better predict the success of their experiential campaigns by using a simple scoring system in three core areas. Intent to share, intent to engage, brand impact. Bringing that data to life with a shareable and dynamic experience dashboard with norms to compare against other experiential activations and of course with predictive return on experience and insights that help you create experiences that customers love. Experiences customers remember, experiences customers reward.
Okay, so I hope that kind of gives you just a, a very high level of the different types of, you know, activities, activations that you can, you can test in this. And um, as you can see, it's a very conversational, conversational style, it becomes a part of the, you know, the experience. And it's, it's really in the moment. Uh, being in the moment is key to all of this. You know, it allows you to reflect your brand image. It's the look and feel of your of your activation. And it's like not an old school boring survey. Um, and I think you can all appreciate that part of it. Um, it's mobile, it's text, it's Qualquant, it's video, in all in one a solution. It's really is it's experiential measurement. So it again, it just becomes a part of your your activation and and kind of that fluid feeling. Um, and but at the same time, getting you quantitative and qualitative in the moment insights, pre-testing as well as in uh, in the moment. On the analytics side of things, BXP allows you to really see, allows you to really see how the experience perform on the KPI dashboard. You saw that in the video, um, how that compares to you know other companies, uh, other categories. Um, there's also the digestible. Uh, deliverables. So this is the dashboard, of course, but, you know, mobile dynamic deliverables, video reels, full report of the, the diagnostics. So not a huge hard sell here, but that's BXP. Um, so let's, let's move on now. Let's hear from our experts on, you know, what really their key takeaway is for us, all of us trying to learn here more about experiential marketing and how to measure it. So maybe uh, you could give some advice to, to all of us. Do you think Eileen, you could kick us off? <laughs> Sure. So um, my key takeaway is that experiential is really exciting and the potential of high impact um, uh, activations for marketers are immense. Um, it's also attracting huge spend, but it's not without its risks. So rigorous testing, insight based optimization and brand impact measurement are needed if experiential is really going to play in the marketing big leagues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks, Eileen. Um, what about you, Greg? You have any advice for us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I would say that uh, if there is one piece of advice which I would give out on something like this, okay, it would really be that um, we need to uh, be willing um, to think beyond conventional metrics, okay, and just keeping in mind that conventional metrics are fine for measuring the conventional. But uh, we're really, experiences are really about the unconventional. They're different, they're novel. And so we're gonna to have to be a little bit unconventional on how we measure and how we assess. True, yeah, thank you for that. And what about you, Ed? Can you uh, finish us off here on some key advice from the experts? <laughs> You're on mute. My advice is to uh, is to take a leadership position. You know, if you're working for an organization, uh, particularly in, the, in maybe the measurement uh, capacity, and you're being asked about experiential and how can we measure it, then then that's great. And I hope that you will take away from this uh, from this webinar that the uh, BXP solution is, I think, quite uh, uh, quite strong. It's comprehensive, and it really meets the moment that uh, that that Greg and Eileen have both uh, discussed so eloquently. Uh, but if you haven't been asked about it, then here's the chance to really raise it with the organization. If you're not being asked, get in front of this. Help your organization to get uh, in front of this. Learn the lessons that uh, uh, that the that the Cokes and the IMAXs have have learned, namely that measurement matters. It will create better outcomes, and uh, and there's an opportunity to be the one to to bring this to your organization. And so I think I would just end by saying we know experiential uh, and brand experiences matters to consumers. It matters to global brands like Coke, and it should matter to all of you on this webinar today. Great, thank you. Great advice, good. Thank you so much for for all of your your help. Um, you know the you know I just wanted to take a minute here now to kind of wrap things up. Thank you to our special uh, expert speakers. It's been a you know a real pleasure hosting today. Um, for those of you on the call, uh, we have the brand experience barometer report that'll be sent out to you or you can reach out to us to receive it if you're interested in that. Um, and so now I'd like to kind of turn it over to Eileen if there was any questions in the Q&A widget, did anything come in? Yeah, there, there are a few questions. 
Um, one is that, you know, when you, when you think about the wide variety of kinds of experiences, can you tell us, do the, are, are the tools you've been talking about today appropriate for all kinds of experiences, just digital experiences? Um, you know, how, how can it be used? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it does run the full gamut. It, you know, most companies have kind of traditional ways for, for television advertising. Think of non-traditional, so physical, uh, like in the moment type of activations that you're creating. And again, like things like um, they can be held at events, it can be sponsorship type of activations that are pop up, and it can also be digital as well. So I don't know, Greg, if you have some other thoughts on that in terms of the different types of activations. You know, I think it's uh, it really becomes a lot easier to think about what can it not measure, okay, as opposed <laughs> to what it can, okay. So I think that uh, we've got, you know, a lot of traditional uh, measurement products, which are good for being able to measure those uh, small, uh, that small number of uh, touch points we have where consumers are in passive mode sitting on their couch, okay. That very definitely is not, you know, experiences. When you're talking about getting, uh, you know, getting out and about, whether or not it's at a music concert or a retail experience in a store, perhaps it's just in your own uh, kitchen, uh, playing around uh, with a uh, with an augmented reality offering that we've got. There's a lot of different, uh, uh, just an entire richness and a breadth of experiences which uh, frankly, uh, we've been able to uh, use this to be able to measure. That's great. And Greg, this next question is sort of for you too. Um, you know, in traditional advertising in particular, a lot of the ideas came from the agencies. There was an inherent tension between agencies' desire to be creative and marketers' um, a desire to quantify the impact. How's that working in experiential? Are agencies involved? Are they protesting, not protesting, but <laughs> in favor of testing <laughs> or <laughs> against it? Well, I'd say that we've taken a uh, kind of a uh, uh, leading approach at Coca-Cola, okay, where we have uh, stood up uh, Studio X, which is a unique combination mm -hmm. of uh, Coca-Cola company as well as our agency. And uh, there's also a component in there that, uh, that uh, allows us to uh, draw upon ideas from uh, outside the agency environment as well. And one of the things that we're seeing there is that rather than having a uh, traditional um, approach where frankly, uh, agencies can be a little bit reluctant to have, uh, to have free testing. And uh, there can be some conflict. That's the way it was traditionally. What we have here is a environment where agencies are very interested and hungry for information. So I can say at Coca-Cola, we just haven't had that same type of conflict, okay, over, uh, um, over uh, testing that I have experienced years past at other companies. And I think that that's because uh, it, because the best experiences are experiences where uh, where there is some uh, co-creation which is going on, where there is tight collaboration between uh, between agency partners and uh, the and brand. And as a result, uh, you know, the, no, we have not had that type of problem that we've seen in the past. That's great to hear. It's sort of the advantage of a clean slate, fresh approach, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the next question I've got here is, um, let me just read this to you. The rise of experiential reminds us of how social evolved. Big social campaigns were supported by traditional uh, big budgets. Uh, do you see that happening with experiential? In other words, are, are, are we seeing uh, people use traditional techniques to promote experiences? Like how, how do those two pieces fit together? Well, I'd say kind of uh, maybe a little bit yes, but mostly no. I'd be very, very cautious to say that the uh, rise of experiential is uh, mirrors what happened with social. 
And part of that is because when you really think about it, social was something that was uh, in many ways new to the world, okay? Whereas experiential, let's be honest, has been around for a while, okay? I think back as a kid, you know, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but when I was helping my dad work in his shop, you know, we had experiential marketing, which we did. I can think about uh, in terms of, uh, you know, big traditional budgets, if someone wants to bring that up, I can think of uh, some of a brilliant experiential marketing campaign that a small uh, uh, mobile telecommunications company used uh, that involved uh, uh, chalk and uh, drawing on sidewalks in front of stores. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are a variety of different ways of being able to uh, do experiential, okay? Some of which might be very big, okay? And some of which uh, might be small. That's kind of the beauty of it is the scalability here. You're not uh, necessarily bound uh, by the same rules as by uh, broadcast. And I think that right. because it's something which does have its uh, roots going all the way back to the dawn of marketing, um, I think that people get their heads around the fact that it doesn't have to mirror uh, something like broadcast. Mm -hmm. That's great. Dara, I guess this one would be kind of for you is like, how do you actually capture feedback during live events? Okay, so uh, the way that we capture uh, feedback during a live event is there is a mobile first uh, conversational survey that uh, people come into either through the QR code or pushed out through maybe a social influencer or ticket pushed out. They come into that chat and they're actually asked questions um, and they're specific questions that we ask them that are tied to our KPIs. Uh, they go through the chat survey. They can take pictures and video and all of that data is captured in real time so we can see all of the results coming in. Um, and from there, that's where we uh, then post survey. That's where we run all of the analytics. Great, thank you. Um, and here's a question from uh, an old friend of mine. Hi, Diane. Um, <laughs> what are some of the ways you have you've seen to demonstrate how local activation events and experiences roll up to support the broader brand? So, in other words, how do how do kind of local activations? Um, build broader brand equity or brand, brand advocacy? I mean, I, I can tell you a little bit, Diane, from my perspective, when I was at, at IMAX, we did a lot of local activation in, in either with a given um, cinema chain or in kind of marquee locations. And uh, we sort of saw it as sort of a, a an aggregation of incremental gains, right? Some really great experience would happen. Um, hopefully people would take to social and talk about it. Um, and then we would either try and cascade it to, to more locations, or we would start to work some of the messaging into our broader brand um, story. So, so in general, we felt that local activations, particularly if there was some consistency and continuity and they could be laddered up to a bigger idea, um, actually were super brand building and, you know, particularly if we could engage sort of our rabid fanboys um, who were super important to our brand, um, they, they, those local activations had wildly disproportionate impact. Um, I think as we build our norms on BXP, that might be one of the things that we'll be able to, to um, provide more and more normative guidance on um, is, is sort of the, the beyond local how, do, how does an activation um, sort of virtually scale? Hey, I, I mean, just, just to just one of the, oh, go ahead, Greg. Oops. I, I think one of the uh, fascinating things about what you mentioned there, Eileen, is that uh, it also uh, dovetails nicely with the idea of, experiment, of experimentation, okay? Something which brands realize are uh, is increasingly important, okay? To try out different things. And one of the nice things, because experiences are very often uh, can be localized, okay, totally. is one the opportunity to try different things, try different experiments, uh, experiences, measure them in a proper experimental way, okay, right. and then use that to uh, be able to innovate and get ahead of the curve. So, right, I mean, it reminds me of the days of test markets, right, when we would do something on a small scale before we 
blew it out to the world. Ed, you had a point you wanted to add? Yeah, I would just say the issue of local is, you know, there is a, a, a people like the Edelman Trust Barometer talk about a lack of trust in, in national, international institutions. And they say the locus of trust is local. Mm -hmm. So if you're running something locally, you're, you're, you're with people who you feel an affinity for. And one of the reasons, as Dara mentioned earlier, that uh, as we built out our, our norms for BXP, we think this idea of shareability is so important. So I can I can engage in something locally. I can I can really um, uh, you know embrace it. And then if I choose to post it on social media, now all of a sudden it it travels the it travels the country. It travels the the world, depending on who my connections are. And the same thing with my offline word of mouth. So then you start to sort of take something that's local, but through the consumer point of view, it then also begins to uh, uh, to expand. And then the people who are who are experiencing that, if Greg tells me about something, maybe the next time I see something about that brand coming to my community, I'm more likely to now get engaged with it. That's a great point, Ed. So this is sort of our last call for any questions. Are there any additional questions that people would like to pop into the widget? I'm not seeing anything new coming in. So Dara, over to you to just let people yeah. know how we'll be following up. Sounds good. So we will. Uh, yes, thank you uh, again to all of our experts and thank you for everyone for joining us. We do have a QR code on the bottom left here. If you wanted to hover over that, that gives you an experience that gives you what the chat look feels like. So come in through your, you know, the camera on your mobile phone. Um, it gives you a sense of how to, you know, the, the look and feel of a, of a chat for an experiential activation. On the barometer report, we'll get that over to you or you um, you can uh, request it from us as well. So hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and thanks again. Take care. Bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks.